back on the Zero Hour. This is your host, Richard R.J. Escow. Joining us now to discuss uh, some censorship uh, or discrediting attacks he's been dealing with once again, and also talk about some news developments in the Middle East, and who knows, maybe other stuff will come up too, is uh, Max Blumenthal. Max's latest book is The Management of Savagery. His website is uh, thegrayzone.com. Uh, he is a co-managing uh, editor there, I think, and he is also a co-host of the Moderate Rebels podcast, and he joins us now. So, Max, thanks for coming back on the program. Thanks for having me back. Uh, it's always good to talk to you, but, and before we get started with your, uh, you know, much more serious censorship travails, I just wanted to share something with you. So, uh, I had your uh, associate, Ben Norton, on a few weeks ago and told him i been knocked off Twitter, and I've been off Twitter now for three and a half months. In a few more weeks, they'll be able to cancel the account for non-use, uh, but they won't won't let me back on. Uh, and they they are not saying they're censoring me; they're just not doing letting me back after I was hacked. And then I found out something interesting yesterday, which is I haven't edited a Wikipedia article in a long time, and maybe I've done it once a year for the past five years, but I hit a wrong button yesterday and got a notice, I guess I had hit an edit button, you are banned from editing Wikipedia uh, for until October 29th, from last October, shows you how often I try, and uh, basically it says, I won't read all this stuff that I took, but first, uh, one page said, uh, uh, you know, I must have breached page restrictions, including ones that might not have been visible from my mobile device, uh, but you get banned anyway. And then there was another one after that from an administrator, you know, one of these volunteers named IceWiz, I-C-E-W-H-I-Z. Uh, reason for my banning Max Blumenthal you have shown interest in the Arab-Israeli conflict due to past disruption in this topic area, a more stringent set of rules called discretionary sanctions is in effect. Uh, an administrator may impose sanctions on editors, meaning people like me, uh, who do not follow the page with specific restrictions, again, which may not be visible on your device. So all I can remember is one factual correction I made to a casualty rates following the attack on Gaza. Um, and apparently without trial or, uh, you know, any cause to complain, because I have shown, quote unquote, interest in the Arab-Israeli conflict, I am now banned from uh, uh, being part of the Wikipedia community. So I don't know. Got any thoughts about that? Well, what, what, I mean, what do you think it is? It it's, seems highly unusual. I mean, yeah, this... it's, yeah, it seems to me that what is happening here. And by the way, I went to look up Ice Quiz, uh, who is himself or herself now banned. Um, but it appears to me that they have set special censorship rules in effect uh, with no right of appeal that might apply to anyone who uh, offers any modification to a page uh, that has anything to do with the so-called Arab-Israeli conflict, as they put it. Um, and that there, despite the fact that I've seen gross uh, misstatements of fact, uh, but not apparently, uh, and none that I've seen are especially sympathetic to the Palestinians, let's put it that way, but it, it seems to me that there's a regime of censorship in place here. Definitely. That's been my experience too. Um, that's been the experience of the Gray Zone, the website I founded. It's a news site. We investigate and report on uh, many of these sort of regime change deceptions that are deployed to stimulate public support for military interventions or the new Cold War with China and Russia. And that's a, a position that 
people in power inside the Beltway, um, from Washington to London and around around the West, and as, as well as in corporate media, don't want anyone to be taking right now. And fewer and fewer self-styled progressive outlets are taking it. So we, um, and I'm sure Ben discussed this with you, uh, my colleague Ben Norton, right. that we were listed as a deprecated source by Wikipedia. That means we're on a list of sites that supposedly falsify information or participate in disinformation. And that list has been compiled by supposedly organic editors, which isn't completely not what took place. The editors are a coalition of tightly organized, coordinated trolls, some of whom may have been affiliated with states, uh, figures who dedicate their days to basically desecrating the Wikipedia pages of anti-war voices and preventing anti-war voices like yourself from becoming editors. And they're uh, violating Wikipedia rules explicitly by arguing on the basis of our political stances and ideology instead of the facts, because at no point have any of these editors or anyone anywhere demonstrated that the gray zone has fabricated stories or issued major factual errors without correcting them. And so we're listed along sites like Telesur, which is a Latin American broadcasting entity that is also, you know, while it's leftist, socialist in orientation, supported uh, partly by the Venezuelan government, it's also a reputable outlet that publishes facts, far more factual than the right-wing corporate Latin American broadcasters like Univision. But they are deprecated as well. So it's basically a political blacklist on Wikipedia. You're not allowed to cite us. And so that relates to my own Wikipedia page, which if you look at right now and you don't know who I am, you're, you're going to come away basically thinking that I am, am a Holocaust-denying Russian and Chinese agent. And it's been edited substantially. I mean, almost 50%, like at least 40% of my page is edited by one individual who may not actually be one individual named Philip Cross. And if you look at Philip Cross's edits, every day Philip Cross makes, you know, 20 to 50 edits on on the websites, on the Wikipedia pages of anti-war voices to denigrate them, discredit them. And Philip Cross is running rampant with the express approval, the explicit stated approval of Wikipedia founder Jimmy Wales, a right-wing libertarian lover of Ayn Rand, who has taken the opportunity to block me on Twitter, even though I've maybe made a few mild criticisms of, in the, of him in the past. So it's obvious that what is taking place on Wikipedia is a political censorship regime aimed at stifling the voices of anti-war journalists and alternative media and specifically targeting the gray zone because we're doing so much damage to this bogus narrative of the new Cold War, which is so dangerous and hostile. And I have no way, for example, on my own page of pushing back. No one does when a book review of my last book, The Management of Savagery, which was filled with falsehoods, which was published by someone named Lydia Wilson, who is a Pentagon-funded researcher, uh, smears me and my book I have no way of publishing my response or quoting from my response on Wikipedia because my response was published at the gray zone, which is deprecated, uh, just to give you an, a sense of how this censorship regime works. And so below, above this coalition of editors, these kind of neoconservative, um, anti-anti-war editors is a larger consortium of editors or a more, they're like the holy oracle of Wikipedia, and they're called the skeptics. And they believe in centrism, and they believe that centrism is necessarily the equivalent of objectivity. And Jimmy Wales explicitly supports the skeptics as his kind of final say on political Wikipedia. So, so there you have the censorship re regime of Wikipedia. Then Wikipedia if you Google my name, Wikipedia immediately comes up to the right of the site. And so anyone who Googles me 
we'll see whatever this coalition uh, of faceless neocon editors wants them to see. Uh, you don't see other entries. It, it's, it's, it's sort of built into Google. Finally, um, any journalist who wants to smear me from a mainstream site or attack the gray zone can be sure that this coalition of editors will immediately attach their article to uh, our pages without us having any ability to respond. So Wikipedia is essentially a bulletin board for corporate media and the war state in Washington. See, I think this is so important, Max, because people don't realize this. And it seems to me, you know, it's, I think it's well understood now uh, that economically, these, you know, while Wikipedia is a nonprofit, unlike Facebook and some of the others, that economically these tech companies uh, get a monopoly position and then abuse it. I think it's less understood that informationally they do the same thing and that there's no right of appeal. There's no uh, democratic process or marketplace of ideas. And in fact, the centrist, uh, you know, self-described liberals uh, who benefit from this system actually celebrate the fact that that uh, that there is no democracy, that there is no accountability, that there is no transparency. I've had people say, yeah, well, it's a private corporation. They can do what they want as if that somehow is a good thing that the discourse is being dominated by these tech companies, Facebook, Google, uh, Wikipedia, Twitter, and that uh, you and I have no rights as if, yeah, it makes them happy, I guess, because their worldview is being uh, systematically and undemocratically enforced, but it bears no resemblance to the kind of society they profess to want. Right. I mean, it's, it, but, but it's marketed as this democratic objective people's encyclopedia where the public gets to decide based on consensus, uh, what appears and what is true. But, Data showed again and again that less than 1% of people who participate in Wikipedia, who read the site, actually edit it. And of those editors, only 3% are accountable for the majority of edits on the site. So a minority of the minority of Wikipedia users are editing the site. And then you have outlets like Axios actually hiring PR firms to polish up their reputation on on Wikipedia. I mean, this happens all the time. And I am sure that some private or possibly state interest is incentivizing editors to denigrate the gray zone. They basically turned Wikipedia into what it was always intended to be. If you take a look at its board members, if you take a look at the director of the Wikimedia Foundation, Catherine Marr, who spent her very short career as a person who's younger than I am, working for US regime change organizations like the National Democratic Institute. What it was intended to be was a centrist propaganda mechanism, or I would even call it sort of a, a centrist defamation machine, where anyone who diverges from the Western consensus, particularly on foreign policy, can be guaranteed that they'll be denigrated. Um, and, and someone like me, I have no power or ability to erase my page. You know, it's right. a bulletin board for elite attacks. If I wanted to erase my page, I couldn't do it. Someone like Kyle Kulinski, on the other hand, who, do, who you know, does what you do. He's a really popular podcaster, someone who hits back hard against the Democratic Party establishment. He had his page, er, page erased against his will without explanation, and he has no way of reinstalling it. I, and I, I wanted to tell him like, man, that's a good thing. You're lucky because, uh, this is, this is what the whole, whole public sees and you yourself have no control over your own reputation. I mean, one of the first things that this Philip Cross character started to do when he began vandalizing my page was, uh, lowering my achievements on the page. More recently, he removed all references to my writing in mainstream media. I don't on what grounds? I don't know how how you can do that and justify it. I don't know. I know what the objective is. It's to make me look more marginal. And an, another thing he did was remove a nation article by Aaron Mate, who is my, 
my colleague at the gray zone on the basis that while the nation is a legitimate source, Aaron writes and produces material for the gray zone, which is a deprecated source. So anyone affiliated with us can have their material, their articles, their work erased at more mainstream publications. And there's really no grounds for doing this. Um, it's just sort of a free for all, but this applies to all social media sites. So what we, right. I, we yeah, yeah, I, I hundred percent agree and i think philip cross by the way isn't he the one uh who appears sometimes to make edits at a rate that would be faster than humanly possible that they just uh, you know several times a minute or something well, one of those editors seem to be doing that i can't remember if it was philip cross yeah but it's like it's like it's like wilt chamberlain saying he had sex with ten thousand women which would have meant that he would have had to have had sex with several women a day throughout his entire adult life which is almost humanly impossible Possible. I mean, maybe that's why they called him Wilt the Stilt. I don't know. But Philip right. Cross is doing like military grade edits and claiming that he's one person. The story is that he has a, a mental issue and that he lives at home with his mother somewhere in England. George Galloway, the former British parliamentarian right. and broadcaster, tracked him down. But that could just be the cover story for what Philip Cross really is. Yeah. Yeah, well, absolutely. And again, we're talking with journalist Max Blumenthal. And then in terms of the other technology, I mean, again, liberals are kind of, or some centrist liberals are celebrating the fact that unnamed uh, um, consortiums of intelligence officials and God knows who else are deciding which stories get boosted, which don't on Facebook, Twitter, whatever. And I know there's, you know, we start going down uh, the forms of sense, algorithmic censorship going on there. It's, uh, it's, it's, it, there's a lot of detail, but basically, you know, I consider all of this to be a mass weapon of misinformation that, you know, uh, makes any other form of like chastisement or whatever people are upset about now nowadays uh, absolutely pale in significance because uh, they can systematically, and I think are systematically silencing dissenting voices. That, and, and that's the point. Uh, also, and, and, and also to silence counter hegemonic media, the media uh, that's backed by countries that the U.S. considers part of the, the axis of evil. They don't get to tell their story to the U.S. public or to the West. So for on your first point, though, I'm really glad that you brought up that some liberals um, don't really see this as a threat and even are welcoming it. Um, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is someone who very uh, profusely celebrated Twitter's decision to label the state affiliated media only of Russia and China as such and not touch US media. And, you know, leaving aside the double standard there, which is obviously designed to suppress counter hegemonic sites like RT or CGTN, Xinhua, um, Global Times, even uh, iPanda, the Chinese uh, panda site was labeled. And to basically consider the voice of America, radio Free Asia, Radio Free Europe sites, which operate under a mission statement to advance U.S. foreign policy or the broad objectives of U.S. foreign policy. Leaving aside the double standards, um, it's interesting or really revealing that AOC has focused so much since being uh, elected to Congress on so-called disinformation, which is this really subjective term that's being spun into anything that contravenes the objectives of U.S. empire. And she's doing so little, if not anything, on media reform, on democratizing media, which was the single-minded obsession of people like the late Danny Schechter, someone who was one of the right. first voices in U.S. alternative media, uh, or Bob McChesney, these figures. She isn't talking about media reform because she doesn't actually come from any real left-wing social movement, and she's been cultivated within the world of the Democratic Party. So she thinks that disinformation is this great threat when the real threat is monopolization of media. The real threat is just the sheer existence of the corporate media. And politicians who identify as progressives have even stopped using this language 
of corporate media that I found, you know, familiar in the, you know, old days during the mid 2000s when I was breaking into online media around the nation and alternate. Uh, and we've entered a new generation, which is really tragic. So the social media sites that we uh, rely on basically as our digital commons, which are controlled by Silicon Valley tech billionaires, are essentially themselves state-affiliated media. And you have U.S.-funded cutouts like the Atlantic Council, which is this corrupt pay-for-play U.S. NATO-funded think tank, coming in and consulting with Twitter on which accounts to take down, on basically what policies to implement. And behind that, you basically have the State Department telling these uh, social media tech oligarchs what to do because the internet is actually right now a more important and critical battle space than the than outer space or than actual physical territory in some cases. And that's been clear that the U.S. through the State Department and its intelligence apparatus has been trying to monopolize the internet itself to prevent Russia and China from competing and present a counter hegemonic point of view. Well, I've never uh, begun a sentence this way, Max Blumenthal, but I'm so old that I remember when it was almost universally accepted in this country to at least say that it's a bad thing to have the government control the media. That that yeah. was at least we gave lips service to that idea. Now I find people are saying, I'm, you know, conservative and liberal. Nah, control them, crack down on them. Let's get some intelligence officials together with some uh, tycoons and, and we'll figure out what they can say and can't say. And that that is directly affecting pe people like, well, you more so, but people like you and me. I mean, I, it's, and everybody's going, eh, you know, it's so you know, I'm not sure what the solution is, except more discussions like this and more uh, movement building around it. But to me, I, I agree with you 100 percent. This is the you know, this is the battle space of the future in a lot of ways. Uh, otherwise, we're only going to hear what they want us to hear in a large and big way. That's already true that we only see and hear what they want us to see and hear, um, not not a pretty state of affairs. And you've also been dealing now with, uh, uh, in addition to all of this, you've had this, uh, these people, Kodo Press, whatever, and Kodo these story, other people. Yeah, yeah Kodo Story, I'm sorry. Uh, basically uh, disparaging you even more. And, uh, uh, you know, maybe just briefly tell us about that and then we'll move on. But well, yeah, I mean, there's a lot to, to say there. I mean, it's worth, just before we get into that, noting that uh, this week, Mike Pompeo, the Secretary of State, rolled out a so-called clean internet, which is clean of Chinese uh, dirtiness. I mean, it's a completely racist rollout for uh, what is the U.S. imperial objective going forward, which is to turn the internet into its sole dominion. And so that means that um, social media sites like TikTok, which have won over, uh, you know, Zoomers and millennials by storm, have been basically seized through piracy by the Trump administration and are being handed over to Microsoft on these bogus grounds of uh, them surveilling American youth on behalf of the Chinese security state. When the reality is that their objection to it is twofold. China's profiting off an American market. And so they want to hand it over to an American company. And number two, it prevents American America's surveillance state from snooping on America's youth and creating all these uh, biometric and facial recognition profiles of them to get a sense of their habits because it's Chinese run. So th that, this is one of the most critical points to understand about empire going forward. And it will will affect all of us. And finally, it's an insult to all of our intelligence as media consumers, as citizens, that we can't sort out uh, the fake news from the real news, that we don't know what's real. It's basically a bunch of elites telling us that we're too stupid to d decide 
for ourselves what news and media we want to consume or how we want to communicate with each other. And so they're, they're going to do it for us. And no one in Congress is standing up against this, literally no one. Um, on the point of us you know, coming under attack at the gray zone, we're just doing so much damage to the State Department's narrative on China that a U.S.-funded website funded through the National Endowment for Democracy, which is the main arm for promoting regime change abroad of the U.S. government. It was spun out of Ronald Reagan's CIA. It's called Coda Story. It's based in you know Georgia on the front lines of NATO. Uh, they attacked us for our reporting on Xinjiang, where it's said you know now we've just recently been hearing like nonstop that China is basically the new Nazi Germany and it's holding millions of Uyghurs in concentration camps. And you know I'm sure that there is repression in Xinjiang and that there is a major security apparatus there because there was a violent violent separatist movement, which over the past decade or so has waged multiple mass casualty attacks, has been influenced by Wahhabi ideology, and China's cracked down hard. I'm not, none of us are disputing that, but what we went and did is looked into the sources of this claim of millions of Muslims in concentration camps, a claim that, you know, I, I haven't seen any journalists go and prove this, and it comes down to two sources. One is a group of uh, Chinese dissidents in Washington funded by the U.S. government, funded by the National Endowment for Democracy, called Chinese Human Rights Defenders, based in the same office as Human Rights Watch. And the other is this far-right, rapture-ready, evangelical German anti-Semite named Adrian Zentz, who poses as this leading researcher of Xinjiang, even though it's unclear if he's ever been to China, speaks Chinese. He says he's led by God against the Communist Party of China, and that he he's written books about the rapture. And and how Jews need to be um, refined through God's fiery furnace. And so we exposed all this at our website, and it just punched a huge hole in this narrative that the State Department, through its through corporate media, has been trying to roll out to promote hostility between the U.S. and China, and specifically to stimulate liberal, progressive hatred of China. Oh, well, they're, they're, they're the worst human rights violator on earth. They're a new Nazi Germany. Um, and so uh, a CODA story promo, you know, did a series of reports, or uh, if you can call them reports, basically smears, calling us genocide deniers. They attacked uh, someone who was a private citizen who went to visit Xinjiang on a bike trip for himself and came away with a fairly positive impression. Uh, he was smeared. Carl Zha, who is Chinese, who's done a lot of pushback against the sort of official new Cold War narrative, he was smeared as well. But what they failed to do in this article is dispute a single thing we publish. And that's always the case with the attacks on us. They never dispute the facts. I don't care if you know everyone else is afraid to take this on and we're gonna get called genocide deniers or whatever. The facts matter. And facts can actually save lives as the new Cold War could turn hot. So that's why we did these reports and no one's been able to knock them down. And how do I know that the State Department was threatened by this? Because in a follow-up report by Axios, this corporate outlet, which is, you know, basically, you know, just, uh, well, they've, they've, they have a correspondent who's basically their anti-China correspondent named Bethany Allen Ebrahimian. And she also failed to dispute any of the facts we published. But instead, she went to Congress to the ranking Republican chair of the House Foreign Affairs Committee to get a quote denouncing us and denouncing a World Health Organization official for retweeting one of our factual reports. So what is what is Michael McCall at the House Foreign Affairs Committee, but basically a lackey of Mike Pompeo's State Department, uh, not only attacking us for challenging the official narrative on Xinjiang through facts, but attacking the World Health Organization and using us as a kind of cudgel against it. Uh, this was a really remarkable moment for me to have such a high-ranking uh, congressman denounce us, calling our work, calling uh, the fact that a World Health Organization official retweeted us deeply disturbing. And it confirmed that we're having a huge impact. We're punching a giant hole as a very small organization that gets mocked as fringe or a blog or marginal or whatever, we're punching a huge hole in this hostile 
new Cold War narrative, which really, I think, threatens the entire Earth with nuclear annihilation. Oh, I think there's no question. Um, fortunately, Max Blumenthal, you're not going to get a lot of help there, I don't think, from the Democratic Party uh, establishment, because when it comes to Cold War narratives, China or Russia, it seems that uh, bipartisanship is uh, alive and well. And, and will be, you know, now that the, we know who the Democratic Party ticket is. Yeah, it's worrisome. And by the way, Kamala Harris is also, as you know, close to big tech, the tech industry. So there's also that piece of it. But um, I, did, uh, I did look up on Wikipedia. I looked something up the other day, and it turns out we have always been at war with Eurasia. Um, that's, a, that's a Big Brother reference. Sorry. Um, but um, all right, let's pivot for a second because... You we can talk about Eurasia. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We can talk about the Middle East is what we can talk about. And um, particularly since you've written several books about the Middle East and you've been there a lot and know the area well, uh, a new announcement, and, uh, ben, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, Bibi Netanyahu, peacemaker, uh, new deal with the UAE, and now says the United Arab Emirates, and he's not going to uh, impose his new uh, and even worse map on uh, on Palestinian territory. Um, any reactions to that? Well, I, I don't find it to be that remarkable of a deal. Um, it seems to be a formalization of a relationship that has been in existence for decades, uh, where Israel has had basically basically uh, at, at, at worst a cold peace, if not a you know secret but special relationship with the you know, fake colonial constructed uh, Wahhabi permanent monarchies of Bahrain, the UAE and Saudi Arabia. And the UAE has always been uh, very close to Israel. I mean just a few weeks ago uh, to uh, the UAE purchased weapons from two Israeli arms firms, uh, supposedly on the basis of fighting COVID-19. Um, and this happens all the time. So basically, why I think it's not that remarkable of a deal is that it's being rolled out, at least in the press, it's being discussed as uh, a deal that the UAE cut in order to hold off Israeli annexation of the West Bank, which had been announced through Donald Trump's deal of the century or the steal of the century. Right. And the reality is that the annexation plans of the West Bank are just being put on pause. Um, many of the a areas that are going to be formally annexed have already been informally annexed. And now through this formalization of relations between Israel and the UAE, basically an inking of the special relationship, Israel now has an excuse and specifically Specifically, Netanyahu has an excuse not to go ahead with annexation right away. Um, and Netanyahu has political reasons not to. He's on trial for corruption. He's facing multiple corruption charges. Uh, he's trying to hold on to a governing coalition. Donald Trump is uh, going into a campaign himself or heading into the final 100 days. And in Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu is under attack from the right for not going ahead with annexation. He's been attacked in the press. Um, Sheldon Adelson, who is sort of the benefactor, the casino baron who funded the deal of the century and has sponsored the careers of many of the officials behind it, including Netanyahu, he's getting angry. He just had a public spat with Donald Trump. So this gives Netanyahu cover to put the annexation plans on pause while entering into this formal new alliance, which is being aggressively encouraged by Washington, because not only is this about Palestine, but it's about the maximum pressure campaign against Iran. And the UAE and Israel have, enjoy this tight bond with Mohammed bin Salman, Saudi Arabia, against Iran. And meanwhile, life won't get even the tiniest bit better for uh, the Palestinians, I imagine. No, I mean, this is also about keeping the Palestinian Authority in place. 
Greece as an occupation subcontractor in the West Bank. Um, the UAE subsidizes its salaries and the salaries of officials. And meanwhile, the West Bank is being chewed up and Israel still plans to annex the large settlements, uh, settlements like Mali Adumim, which, I mean, if you drive by it, you feel like you're driving by a city. Um, but actually, the master plan of Mali Adumim uh, extends from the east of Jerusalem, basically completely surrounding the Palestinian part of East Jerusalem, which was supposed to have been the Palestinian capital in a two-state solution. And it extends all the way through the West Bank, cutting it in half. So and this is already thing, a chopping block. Yeah. Yeah. And another, th I guess, point I wanted to make, or ask you anyway, is that it seems to me that everybody's looking at this as well. Uh, Israel's agreed not to expand its settlements, but uh, my understanding, according to in inter national law, the settlements already there are illegal. So the other way to look at it is you now have an Arab nation legitimizing the illegal occupation, according to the United Nations and international law, of another country's territory. Am I right about that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they've delegitimized not just, um, you know, pal Palestinian claims, but UN resolutions, like Resolution 242, uh, which uh, calls for Israel to end the occupation of uh, territory that extends beyond 1967 armistice lines, and uh, even Resolution 181, which calls effectively for Israel to uh, issue equal rights to Palestinian citizens of Israel. And then you have the whole Gaza Strip left out of this. The Gaza Strip is effectively controlled by Hamas, which is a Islamist political movement that came into power there after winning uh, national elections in 2006-7, uh, which uh, were invalidated by the U.S. and Israel. The U.S., through Elliot Abrams, attempted a, a coup in Gaza through the, with the Palestinian Authority. It failed. Hamas remains in power and they turned to the monarchy of Qatar uh, for a lot of their support um, to pay for their infrastructure and so on. And Israel has this quiet relationship with Qatar where they're like, you know, keep paying for their infrastructure, take the burden off, off our hands, keep uh, providing them with fuel so that we don't have a huge humanitarian crisis on our hands. But Qatar is at odds odds with the UAE. They despise each other. The UAE had right. signed on to the Saudi Arabian embargo and basically regime change attempt against Qatar. So the Gaza Strip is completely left out of this scenario. Um, it's really about Israel, the West Bank, and then severing the Gaza Strip. And I know that the ultimate plan, the real like long-term agenda for the deal of the century, which really represents this alliance between the Gulf states and the Kud party and its cutouts within Washington and the Trump administration is to completely take that population from the Gaza Strip and that, that surplus humanity that's warehoused there and to hand them over to a country like Egypt to just get rid of them completely. Yeah. Which is yeah. pretty disturbing. It's extremely disturbing. Um, and the conditions there are, are extremely disturbing. And, and right. finally, you know, you know, yeah. Finally, just really quickly, I mean, you have a Democratic ticket coming in that will say nothing about this because, I mean, Biden personally intervened in the Democratic Platform Committee to prevent any mention of the word occupation of Palestine. And K Kamala Harris feasts at the trough of the Israel lobby. Her career has depended heavily on her support, uh, unwavering support for Israeli apartheid. So there's very little hope there. And I don't think that, you know, those who have been around the Bernie campaign and s supported him kind of taking a, a moderate position on Palestine, breaking away from the Democratic Party hardline consensus, have any hope of putting pressure on this administration. I, I fear, in that I, 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 at least as far as that's concerned, that, uh, that you're probably right. Uh, anything else you want to say before I let you go, Max? Well, uh, follow us at thegrayzone.com. 
And uh, right. my I... podcast with Ben Norton at Moderate Rebels, moderaterebels.com. All right. Well, people take that to heart. I follow you guys there. <laughs> and uh, Max Blumenthal, author of The Management of Savagery, as well as other books, and uh, co editor of The Gray Zone. Uh, thanks, as always, for the great work you do. And thanks, as always, for coming on the program. Thanks for having me, RJ. We'll be right back after this. I am Richard R.J. Escow, and this is The Zero Hour.